Um, thank you so much, Martha, for being here and doing this. Okay, thank you, Shunti. Uh, and just as a, just to add to what she said, thank you for the beautiful introduction. Um, she also, uh, Shruti asked me to share with you how I got started in Ayurveda, because I think a lot of us uh, get started in Ayurveda by a variety of reasons. For me, it actually started in the mid 80s when I was on the faculty at University of California Davis Medical School. And that's when uh, the AIDS um, was really just taking off. And I was close to San Francisco. So it was very uh, a big concern of mine. So I became an AIDS activist. I was marching on NIH to to demand therapies. And at one of the conferences, they had a satellite workshop on alternative medicine to help support AIDS patients. So I went to that workshop and that was really the first time I heard a little bit about traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda and some of these other therapies to support patients who were really chronically ill with these debilitating diseases. Um, so I started just reading all the books I could on these various therapies, including primarily traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda at that time. Uh, and then as I got interested in yoga, I realized that Ayurveda is a sister science of yoga. And yoga was so powerful. You know, I started doing it because I wanted to, to gain strength and flexibility. I'm also an avid snowboarder. So that was why I really got into yoga. But I s continued to go to yoga and continue to this day because of the way it makes me feel, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. It's just such a powerful uh, therapy, really. Uh, and I thought, well, here's this whole sister science to, to yoga, Ayurveda, and I'd spent my life in medical sciences, so I have to study it. So I just, at that point, just started buying all the books that I could. I started including it in my lectures to medical students, started a course on integrative medicine for medical students, and um, that's when I started bringing alternative practitioners in to talk to medical students. You know, my point with the med students was just like you might refer one of your patients to a cardiologist or neurologist in the future, you might also want to refer one of your patients to an Ayurvedic practitioner or a rolfer or a traditional Chinese medicine or a naturopathic doctor. So I wanted to introduce the medical students to all these practitioners. Um, at that time, I was a friend of Kumar Batra. Some of you may know the name, if you, even if you didn't know him personally. Uh, he's one of the co-founders of NAMA. And uh, his good friend, Cynthia Copel, also a co-founder, came to speak to our students. So that's when I met Cynthia. So um, fast forward, I moved to um, Kauai in 2003 and met Dr. Suhas, who had just started a um, course on Ayurveda here on Kauai. Um, so this is Dr. Suhas Shirsagar. I'm sure you all know who he is. And so I was very fortunate to have overlapped the three years while he was here on the island. So I went through his one year diploma in Ayurveda sciences and also spent six months as an intern in his clinic. Uh, and then after Kerala started the AWP program, then I started studying again with Dr. J and uh, did the AWP program with him, went to India. And uh, that's just pretty much how I got into to Ayurveda. I always thought that it just seemed more like an intuitive science because somehow it just kind of spoke to what I felt like I already knew inside. So even though I had no medical challenges or no reason to kind of seek out Ayurveda, I just, from the time I first started reading about it, it just felt right, you know, and I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. It just, there was something about Ayurveda that just, uh, just rang true and it just got me uh, very interested in, in knowing more and I, just continue to study. It's going to be a lifelong process, I'm sure. So today, the topic of our talk is going to be drug-herb interactions. Um, I, as uh, Shruti mentioned, um, my husband and I had a five-year grant to study mechanisms of interactions between medicinal herbs and pharmaceuticals while we were at the University of California, Davis. So I have spent a number of years researching and, and talking about this topic. And um, I think uh, during my experience, I was um, at one of the conferences with a bunch of herbalists and they had asked me to talk about drug interactions. And uh, when I was talking with them, I was a little concerned when some of them told me during the break that in their intake form, if they see that one of their clients is taking pharmaceuticals, then they're very, very hesitant to use drugs or to use medicinal herbs, excuse me. 
Um, and I thought, well, this is a shame. You know, it, just because your client is taking a pharmaceutical, there's still so much power in these medicinal herbs and they can really help. And in many cases work with the pharmaceutical, which is what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today. Um, so uh, in any case, I've given a, a number of talks about and what's not significant um, when you're looking at things. Uh, but basically, I can I could give this talk in um, about two minutes, basically. The key points are most herbs are safe to use with pharmaceuticals, and they can actually be very beneficial when used with pharmaceuticals. So that's the number one take-home point. There are a few what I call red flag drugs, and that is if you find out that you're, you have a client that's taking one of these medications, you do want to stop, take a breath, and consider the possibilities, and I'm going to cover those uh, as part of this presentation. Um, there's one medicinal herb that can interact with a whole bunch of pharmaceuticals, and that's St. John's wort. So that got everybody's attention when we saw those interactions. But that's pretty much a standalone drug. And now that we understand the chemical composition of St. John's wort, how these chemicals actually on a molecular basis interact with the heme protein and, and other, or the heme and uh, the proteins in uh, cytochrome B450 and other transporters, we know the mechanism and we can say, okay, uh, this particular chemical in this particular plant has a problem. If we saw that chemical in other plants, we might be concerned, but actually it's specific for St. John's wort. So uh, there's one herb that there's big problems that's the only herb I know of that really has big problems. Um, and the last thing that I'm going to mention is it may be useful to go through this next 30 minutes or whatever, uh, just to understand um, the mechanisms. Some of these are theoretical mechanisms uh, by which medicinal herbs can interact with pharmaceuticals. And the reason I say, even though it's theoretical, it might be useful to understand is we really don't understand a lot about drug-herb interactions. And as we understand more, uh, then we can actually, if we see an interaction, this was true for St. John's Ward. After we saw the interaction, then we started doing the work to see what's the mechanism of the interaction. So I think it's good to at least understanding, understand um, how medicinal herbs can interact with pharmaceuticals. So having said that, you know, most of you are perhaps using medicinal herbs and you're uh, aware of the interactions uh, between um, various plants and um, the fact that there can be variability in their effectiveness depending on a whole host of factors, uh, including you know, where it was grown, how it was grown, what the climatic conditions were, how much sun, how much water, how nourishing the soil is for the plant. So all of these factors can have a role in terms of um, the effectiveness of the herb to treat a disorder, as well as the concentration of the chemicals in, in the plant. Uh, a big thing uh, is the dosage form and our formulation. Uh, we saw in the case of kava kava, for example, the dosage form had a huge effect on uh, the possibility of interacting with, uh, with pharmaceuticals. So how it's prepared and the dosage form are very important uh, considerations. Uh, having said that, this is just a, a sl summary slide of a study that we did when I was at Davis. Uh, uh, the immunology department was doing studies on uh, ginseng preparations to boost the immune system, and the results were all over the place. Uh, so we developed an assay for ginsenicides, which are the active constituents uh, for most of the effects of ginseng. And this just shows the variability. There was um, I think something like a hundredfold variability in the concentration of ginsenicides in these samples. And that's not really that surprising when you consider ginseng has to be in the ground for four years before it's really mature enough to have the concentration of ginsenicides to be pharmacologically active. And I think around the world, perhaps few farmers can afford to live, leave a plant in the ground for four years to wait for it to mature. So it probably gets harvested early that might be one explanation uh, for the low ginsenicides, or you know, maybe it just gets diluted out with other components. Um, so um, I'd like to just summarize where we are right now with the limitations of the current knowledge 
regarding uh, medicinal herbs and pharmaceuticals and their interactions. One big problem is that most of the studies that you see in the literature are what we call in vitro studies because they're easy to do, relatively inexpensive, and you can take either a whole herb extract or a component and you can look at its interaction. Uh, a lot of these studies are also done in animals. And usually when they're doing animal studies, they're using really, really high doses, much higher than what would be um, clinically relevant for humans. So right there, we start with two caveats. They're in vitro, which means in the test tube, it could have an effect, but that's at a certain concentration. And how much herb would you have to use to get that concentration in the liver or the heart or wherever it's having its drug interaction? Um, also, a lot of these in vitro studies use really high concentrations uh, of components. Like anytime you read a study, and I've read several, where the concentration of the chemicals that they're looking are, are in millimolar concentrations. That's huge for a physiological effect, you know? You'd have to go down to micromolar to even start talking about a physiological effect. So that's one big problem. And um, I just read a review last week of uh, you know, thousands of articles and most of them were in vitro or animal. And so you can really, it's hard to extrapolate that to humans. Uh, the concentration of herbal components may or may not be known or they may not be clinical, clinically significant. Uh, most of these reports talk about potential interactions. And so there are a lot of potential interactions, but whether or not that's clinical, clinically significant is, is another point. And of course, human studies are available for very few medicinal herbs because it's so expensive to do. So um, a lot of what we have in terms of human studies are anecdotal reports. Oh, there was a patient, they were on this pharmaceutical and they took this medicinal herb and we saw that the pharmaceutical concentrations had changed or the response had changed. So therefore it could be related to the uh, medicinal herb. So these are uh, some of the things we have to uh, consider when we look at the literature. Having said that then, the rest of the talk I'm gonna be talking about how we can predict uh, whether or not there might be an interaction between a medicinal herb and a pharmaceutical. Uh, and the first type is pretty easy to predict. Uh, it's what we would call a pharmacodynamic interaction. And that's where the medicinal herb actually has an effect on the pharmacology uh, of, the, uh, of the pharmaceutical. And so in these cases, this would be a medicinal herb that has a similar effect, you know, something that relaxes and helps you go to sleep uh, might also have an effect on a pharmaceutical that's used to treat anxiety, for example. Uh, the other type of interactions are more difficult to predict. And this is what I spent most of my um, time at UC Davis uh, doing research on. And that is, um, these are called pharmacokinetic interactions. So pharmacokinetics, pharmaco of course means drug and kinetics is movement. So pharmacokinetics means the movement of drugs through the body. So these would be the things that affect the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism and the excretion of the herbs. And so it's really hard to predict, you know, whether a medicinal herb might affect one of these factors uh, regarding the, the pharmaceutical. And again, this is where most of the drug-drug interactions occur. And this is where the clinically significant medicinal herb and drug interactions do occur. So if we talk about these pharmacodynamic interactions, they can be additive or synergistic. That means you know, they have the same effect, so they might potentiate each other. In some cases, the medicinal herb might have an opposite effect. We would call that antagonistic. And in a few cases, there are medicinal herbs that can cause a toxicity. And this is primarily with one particular medication. Uh, the pharmacokinetics I mentioned earlier would be absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the herb. So absorption is how the, the drug gets absorbed. If it's given orally, these would be things that affect um, you know, the absorption from the GI tract. Distribution is how it gets from the blood into the tissues and metabolism excretion, you, you know, what those are. So for additive or synergistic effects, uh, these would be herbs with the similar effects as the pharmaceutical. And this can be very positive if you think about it because this could enhance the effect of the, of the drug. And so it could be used possibly to decrease the drug dosage 
which then might result in fewer adverse drug reactions, which is huge because I don't know of any pharmaceutical that doesn't have adverse drug reactions at some dose. So if you can decrease the dose to eliminate some of these side effects, then, uh, then that's, that's very beneficial to the patients. And I gave just a few examples. And again, these would require counseling with the patient uh, or the client and also careful monitoring. But Brahmi and other herbs that just help mental functioning can be useful with anxiolytics, the drugs that are used to treat uh, anxiety. Uh, Phenogeek or uh, Gemnema could be useful with diabetics, especially pre-diabetes, even if they haven't started medication yet. Indian snake root or Rolofia serpentina with antihypertensives. And this is interesting because the antihypertensives have a lot of side effects. And so by using um, you know, a, an extract of Indian snake root, perhaps you can use less drug. Um, and I know of one naturopathic doctor here on uh, Kauai that actually uses Indian snake root in uh, his patients um, instead of antihypertensives. So it's nice to see that that um, medicinal herb is making a comeback. There's one clinical study that I saw that used, there were 59 different patients with sleep disorders and they wanted to discontinue the benzodiazepine. Now this could be drugs like um, Xanax, uh, um, Valium, um, triazolam, uh, midazolam, a lot of different drugs that are used uh, to, for sleep disorders, but they all have adverse drug reactions and they all have a, a potential for addiction. Uh, so in, these case, in this study, this was a published study, uh, either the patient or the physician wanted to discontinue. And so what they did is they uh, transferred the patients over to an herbal combination and that was used as an aid to decrease the benzodiazepine withdrawal. So as you're decreasing the dose of the benzodiazepine, you can actually start increasing the dose of the medicinal herbs. And I had one patient a few years ago that uh, had mild depression. Uh, she was on therapy with fluoxetine and perhaps should not have been on it in the first place. It was a situational depression. But um, the doctor started her on fluoxetine, and one of the problems with uh, antidepressant drugs is once you start on them, it's sometimes difficult to get off of them. That's why I don't, in most cases, like using antidepressants for situational depression. I think counseling is probably better, and then there are some, you know, Ayurvedic herbs that are good for that. So in any case, she was concerned about the adverse drug reactions or the side effects and becoming dependent you know, on this medication. So I contacted her physician, which I always do before I do any sort of intervention of this type. And he was aware that she wanted to discontinue. He was comfortable with me kind of overseeing, you know, this change. So I worked with her to gradually decrease the dose of fluoxetine or Prozac and uh, gradually increase the dose, in this case of St. John's Ward, because I wanted to um, I didn't want to precipitate any problems and I wanted to just slowly get her off of, uh, off of the antidepressant. At a relatively short period of time, at the end of two months, she was no longer taking fluoxetine. And at six months, she was able to taper off of the St. John's Ward so that now she's not taking anything at all. So this is just one case where medicinal herbs, even though there's an interaction, it's a positive interaction and they can be used with the pharmaceutical or in some cases to help um, uh, patient if they want to discontinue the pharmaceutical. The other type of pharmacodynamic interactions are antagonistic. Uh, these are herbs that have the opposite effect of the pharmaceutical. Um, so they may decrease the drug effect or the side effect. And a couple of examples here, uh, milk thistle has been used because of its concentration of salimerins to be used with hepatotoxic drugs. So they help rebuild the liver after a patient has been on some medications that help destroy the liver. So this is a antagonistic effect, but it's a good antagonistic effect. Goksura or any medicinal herbs that have diuretic effects can be used with corticosteroids because they cause uh, edema and water retention. This is a very interesting study. Uh, turmeric with chronic uh, ethanol use. So we know that chronic ethanol use can have uh, effects on the liver. And I saw one study where actually on a molecular level, they found how turmeric could actually help rebuild the liver. 
So this was an animal study, unfortunately, not in humans, uh, but they did do a study with chronic ethanol use, destroying the liver and showing that if they had been medicated with uh, turmeric at two different doses at the same time that they were given the alcohol, uh, they did not see the effects on the liver. So I thought that was interesting. And there are cases where this antagonistic effect can be harmful, and that would be where it's um, the medicinal herb is having the opposite effect. And one good example is if patients are on immunosuppressive therapy, this would be transplant patients primarily, you don't want to give them immune stimulant herbs because of course that's gonna stimulate the immune system and you're trying to, uh, to depress the immune system. And the uh, last one that I'm gonna mention is it's very rare and not a lot of patients are on digoxin anymore, but this is one of my red flag drugs. If a patient's on digoxin, there can be a lot of problems. One of the problems in this case would be uh, herbs which might cause a decrease in potassium. This would be high dose licorice that has, I said non-DGL, so it has not had the glycerinic acid removed. Uh, most medicinal herbs that now says DGL licorice because glycerinic acid can interact with, uh, with some of the components in the body to cause some problems, including hypertension. But most licorice, uh, medicinal herbs with licorice in it uh, has had the glycerinic acid removed. So licorice in high doses or if it's non-DGL. And then these others that have laxative action. If you use high dose laxatives on a chronic basis, you can get some loss of potassium. And it's usually not a problem. It's usually not that significant unless the patient is uh, taking uh, digoxin. So that would be one concern. Very rare though. Uh, now if we talk, of, uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, maybe I'll just go through some of these slides. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're okay. So the main interactions, as I mentioned earlier, are pharmacokinetic, difficult to predict, because it has nothing to do uh, with the pharmacology. It basically just has to do with, with these factors, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So why are pharmacokinetic interactions clinically relevant? This is why, <laughs> okay. This graph shows basically what happens when a drug is administered, in this case, orally. You'll notice that uh, each one of these You'll notice each, whoops, okay, I was trying to use a pen, but I won't do that. Uh, so each one of these lines represents one dose. So the first dose, you can see a slight increase, and it usually takes about four or five doses to get to what we call steady state. And so this is just showing uh, below a certain level, it's subtherapeutic, above a certain level, it's toxic, and we want the therapeutic range to be right in that area. And this is the drug concentration in plasma, by the way. So you can see then that any herb that caused an increase, you could go into the toxic level. And any herb that caused a decrease in these concentrations, you could go into the subtherapeutic level. So on the right side of this graph, you see the term therapeutic range. This is absolutely critical. In this particular case, the therapeutic range looks very narrow because just with one dose, it's going almost from the top to the bottom. Uh, if the herb, if the drug has a very narrow therapeutic range, then medicinal herbs would be expected to have more of an effect. If it's a very broad therapeutic range, that means you could increase, you could change these drug concentrations by 50 to 100 fold without any problem. Then you would not expect to see an effect with medicinal herbs. And the way that herbs would affect the plasma concentration is through, again, these factors, pharmacokinetics. So the herbs that would affect absorption would be the herbs that have a lot of mucilage in it, like slippery elm, marshmallow root, because they might bind to the pharmaceutical in the stomach and keep it from getting absorbed. And then laxative herbs, you know, for herbs that have a laxative action will increase or will increase the um, mobility of the intestine. So that means that the uh, pharmaceutical could perhaps be in the intestine for shorter periods of time. If it's in the intestine for shorter periods of time or if it's moving through more quickly, you might get uh, less absorption. So these herbs might have an effect. Um, 
herbs with high tannin concentration, which would include a lot of the you know, astringent, herbs, astringent herbs or teas. Uh, tannins will actually bind to pharmaceuticals. Um, back in the day, there was a preparation, I don't remember the name of it, but it, was, uh, it had tannin and charcoal and I think magnesium oxide or something in it. And so tannins will actually bind, physically bind to pharmaceuticals. So that could be an interaction. And the herbs with high mineral contents like calcium, magnesium, and zinc uh, can also bind to some pharmaceuticals. Uh, that would be like antibiotics or the thyroid preparations, anything with T4 or T3 in it. So that then summarizes kind of the, um, the medicinal herbs that might interfere with the absorption of pharmaceuticals. Uh, but the overall effect on, of most herbs would be relatively small. And here's the take home message. Uh, even if there is an interaction, it's a physical interaction. It's not a pharmacological interaction. So because it's physically interacting with the medication to prevent absorption, uh, all you have to do is separate the time of administration, either you know, give the herb two hours before or four hours after the pharmaceutical, as long as they're not in the stomach at the same time and the upper GI tract at the same time, uh, then basically it wouldn't be a problem. Um, another factor that affects both absorption and distribution are these so-called transporter proteins. Uh, these are proteins that um, are located throughout the body. The ones that are most significant are in the gut. And basically, you know, when you think about, uh, when you think about our bodies, <laughs> uh, it's absolutely a brilliant design. Um, our body sees all of these pharmaceuticals as poisons. As a matter of fact, one of my pharmacology professors said, the only difference between a, a drug and a poison is the dose. And our body is, is exquisitely designed to handle these potential poisons. So the minute that we're exposed to something, that we take a drug, say orally, our body basically tries to get rid of it. One way it tries to get rid of it is through these proteins in the, in the gut. One of them is called P glycoprotein. And what it does is as the drug is absorbed through the gut, it actually kicks it back into the intestine. So it keeps it from getting into the bloodstream. Um, another way that, um, uh, that our body was designed to get rid of pharmaceuticals is through metabolism. By making these pharmaceuticals more water soluble, they can be excreted in the urine. But these efflux pumps, um, one of them is uh, the P glycoprotein, it's a common site for drug interactions. And it's often related to one of the enzymes in the liver. Um, it's the CYP3A4. Um, there are also a number of uptake pumps in all the cells in the body. These uh, basically are responsible for organic anions or cations getting into the body. Uh, any charged molecule, it's hard to get through a cell membrane. So these transporter proteins kind of help them get through the, these membranes. And there's a lot less information on these, but probably there's some herbs that could have an effect, uh, at least at high concentrations. Um, as I mentioned, this P glycoprotein is located in the intestine. This is what it looks like. This is um, basically from an article that's showing um, the protein in the membrane. In this case, it's a cell membrane, and you have uh, an anti-tumor drug, a drug to treat cancer, and it's coming into the cell. So you can see on the left side of the slide, the tumor drug is coming into the cell, and then it's going to go over to this P glycoprotein, and it's going to be you know, removed from the cell unless there's an inhibitor present. Uh, and this inhibitor will actually prevent it from, from leaving the cell. So that's the mechanism. Um, so a drug can have effects on this protein to either increase or decrease the amount of drug that's absorbed. Um, and it can also, the same proteins can affect um, how a drug gets into the cells, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and here's one case of, of a medicinal herb, uh, milk thistle, which has these chemicals called salimarins, and it increases the effect of this one tumor drug by inhibiting this protein so that the drugs were able to, to get through and stay. I was looking, oh, this is the slide. I was kind of, excuse me, I was kind of fast forwarding there because I wanted to get here. This actually shows the significance. And I think when the grapefruit juice effect was first discovered years ago, that's got everybody's attention, you know, like if grapefruit juice can interfere with medicinal, with pharmaceuticals. Um, 
what about all these other herbs that patients are taking? So grapefruit juice has, has a huge effect because it works on two different mechanisms. It does work on that pump, that P glycoprotein that's in the intestine. So uh, in this case, the drug is philodipine, uh, which is a heart medication. So philodipine gets absorbed into the gut, but this peptide keeps pushing it out. Um, so basically only about 10% gets absorbed unless you take it with grapefruit juice. And then more like 90% of it gets absorbed. So uh, this is so interesting. When it was first developed, one of my professors at University of California, San Francisco, who did the research, initial research, identifying the chemical in grapefruit juice, he now holds a patent on this chemical and has tried to market it with other pharmaceuticals. Imagine if you took any, any of these medications that are affected by grapefruit juice and you just put the medication in a capsule and you added a little bit of this chemical from grapefruit juice that affects the absorption, you would get almost a tenfold increase in absorption. That means you'd only have to use one tenth the amount of drug to get it absorbed. And of course, then we all know that the, the cost of the medication would come way down, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is just one example of, um, of how the significance, I mean, this is a huge effect, just how something like grapefruit juice can affect the absorption of a pharmaceutical. And in this case, grapefruit juice affects not only the absorption, but it affects the metabolism as well. Um, I'm kind of mixing these, these, pro, these um, transporter proteins in absorption and distribution because they do have an effect on both. Obviously, absorption from the gut is huge, but also distribution into the cells would be the other way. Um, uh, the other uh, type of interaction that affects distribution, which is how the drug gets in and out of cells, is that a lot of drugs are bound to plasma proteins. And if a drug is bound to a plasma protein, it cannot get off the protein and get into the cells um, because it's, kind of, it's bound. So it's only the unbound or the free part of the drug that, that can distribute. So uh, when this was first discovered, we thought, oh, anything that affects protein binding, like for example, aspirin or salicylates is going to affect um, pharma pharmacology. But we find that it's only significant if the drug is about 95% protein bound. So these are actually pretty rare interactions. And then the major site uh, for interactions between drugs and um, herbs would be uh, metabolism, things that affect how the, it occurs primarily in the liver, but also in the intestine, lungs, kidney, brain, and other tissues. And there's a family of enzymes that are responsible for this. Uh, these are some of them. The most important one though is 3A4 right at the top. It's responsible for metabolizing about 50% of all pharmaceuticals. So any medicinal herb that interacts with 3A4, and there are several, <laughs> including St. John's wort, but some other ones too, that would have the potential for affecting uh, um, the concentration of a drug. Um, so some of these um, medicinal herbs that affect metabolism would affect it through increasing metabolism. This would be enzyme induction. And um, it, it seems like there's a call coming in. Uh, sometimes this involves making more enzymes. So this is the, one of the concerns. It may not be apparent until the patient has been taking the medicinal herbs for seven to 10 days. Uh, and this can result in clinically significant drug interactions. This just slide shows um, a heart transplant patient, actually two patients who were taking St. John's wort that increased the metabolism. And then they had transplant rejection. And the spike that goes down just shows how the blood levels went down. Um, they were having monthly. So monthly test to see what the concentration of the drug was in the blood. And there was like this huge drop. And then when they presented at the clinic, they found signs of uh, transplant rejection. And this was because of this interaction. Uh, you'll notice a few herbs that we're familiar with in Ayurveda on the list that can induce metabolism. Uh, garlic, uh, Shankapushpi, 
And the Shankapushpi one is interesting because I saw this in the literature years ago. And um, this, this was actually two patients. So it was more like an anecdotal report initially. Uh, two patients had been on phenytoin to treat their convulsions. Uh, and they came to the clinic with loss of seizure control. And then when they looked at the levels of phenytoin in their blood, there was a decrease in the levels. And they found that the patients, both patients, had been taking Shankapushpi one teaspoon three times a day. Um, so it was assumed that maybe Shankapushpi might have had an effect. So I actually have been emailing these um, uh, investigators. They published it uh, some years ago. But this is what they saw when they did animal studies, that basically the effects of this particular product that has Shankapushpi in it on phenytoin levels, the solid graph shows the phenytoin levels without Shankapushpi, and then the open bars show the effects of Shankapushpi. So it appears that there could be an effect there. Um, uh, so the last couple of slides were where the blood levels go down because of enzyme induction or increasing the metabolism of drug. They can also go up if the metabolism is inhibited. Uh, there are a number of in vitro studies that show this, and so uh, it's easy to predict this if you have in vitro studies. Considering the time, I think I'm just going to fast forward through a lot of these. Uh, here are some of the chemicals. Piperine in long pepper can have an effect. It's usually at high doses. Uh, I think it takes somewhere between 50 and 100 milligrams of piperine to inhibit metabolism. So um, I don't think this is clinically significant. Uh, some of these others are higher concentrations. Uh, garlic actually may have an effect depending on the concentration of allicin and kava kava can have an effect. Um, Okay, Martha. So just, uh huh. Um, so maybe let's keep five minutes for questions. Um, okay. if, so maybe take another two oh. or three minutes to, yes. to wrap up and then we can keep five minutes for questions. Oh, uh, thank you, Shruti. You know, I had put a timer on my uh, talk and I didn't take into, effect, into account that we lost so much time <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> with my problem. So let me just quickly go back through here. Uh, there's just two quick slides. My recommendation is caution in patients when they're taking drugs that are eliminated primarily with metabolism, especially those with narrow range. And then how would you know, this is the big question, how would you know uh, if one of the drugs that the patient's taking is eliminated through metabolism? So I just put this together yesterday. So if you just Google a drug name, drug metabolism, what's going to pop up is something like this. So this tells us right away, simvastatin or Zocor is metabolized. So if you want to know how it's metabolized, Dr. Google <laughs> will let you know. Uh, so if it's eliminated through the kidney, it's not as much of a problem. That's another database, but um, an excretion. Excretion is more theoretical, so I don't think uh, kidney function has that much. There are some concerns with diabetic medications. DM is diabetes mellitus. So if an herb has an effect, then you, there could be a problem there. Warfarin is basically one of my red flag drugs. Uh, antihypertensives can be a problem because anything that increases their metabolism uh, could cause a decrease and there would be a potential for stroke. So those would be the major concerns. Red flag drugs, warfarin or anticoagulants, phenytoin, anticonvulsants, and digoxin, not that many. And if we look at warfarin, it in a there's so many things that can affect <laughs> its concentration. And a lot of these are just dietary components. Red flag herbs, I only know of one, St. John's wort, but it interacts with so many medications that it's really gotten uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of interest. Over a million articles on St. John's wort, on, if you Google it. Uh, so to summarize, um, most herbs can be used with pharmaceuticals without a significant problem, and they may provide a benefit to your patients. Pharmacodynamic interactions are predictable, and you can use that to decrease the drug dosage if you work with the patient's doctor. And we always have to work back with the patient and their physician. Um, the pharmacokinetic interactions, of course, are more difficult to predict. Uh, most common interactions are metabolic. Uh, and let's see, so the bottom line, this is what I do. 
first thing I do is I look at their list of drugs and I check for red flag drugs. Second, if they're on medications, then I look at the pharmacokinetics of the drug. How is it eliminated? Is it metabolized or is it eliminated by the kidney? And then last, I review the herbs for possible components. Again, there are a few components that can be significant uh, and to see if that might also affect you know, how this particular medication is eliminated. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry that we went over, but hopefully there's uh, time for a few questions. Great, thank you so much, Martha. Yeah. Um, so some questions were posted in chat and then otherwise people can also, of course, uh, speak up and ask the question. Um, so Martha, if you're looking at the chat, there was one question about, uh, from Om about the half-life of a drug and possibilities of herb interactions. Um, so I'll, I'll let you take a look in the chat window. Okay, let's see. Okay, the half-life of the drug and possibility of, of, of herb interaction. That's a very good question. Um, the half-life of the drug is basically how, how long the drug stays in the body. It can, since that is a metabolic interaction, it can also be related to absorption and, and other things. Typically, drugs with a short half-life are ones that are uh, metabolized fairly quickly, but they could still, I mean, half-life, um, uh, it kind of depends on more like the pharmacology of the drug and its pharmacokinetics. If it is affected by some of these pathways which are affected by the drugs, then the half-life could be increased or decreased. So that's a very, very good question, but it could still, depending on the uh, medication, how it's eliminated, that's what, that's what I would look at is uh, not necessarily the half-life, but how it's eliminated to see if it could um, be affected by some additional herbs theoretically. On grapefruit juice, uh, you address that, so that. Yes. Uh, okay. So my, can I take one more second? Yes. So the, my major concern is Martha, when when this marketing of using curcumin and using uh, different herbs, ashwagandha, amla, and all these kind of things, unnecessarily any of different combinations, I see that even the vitamin B complex, some companies are adding ashwagandha into it. Yes. without knowing the interaction. So I, that really concerns me when the patient comes on it. The second question is when we speak to the primary care or a specialist, they have no knowledge of ARB or these PKPD studies. They mm -hmm. said, uh, keep doing, doing whatever you're doing. If it's affecting you, it's giving good results. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we, do not, we do not stop that. You're right. Um, so that's very good. And, uh, um, I have not seen anything that's clinically significant in terms of interactions with ashwagandha. Um, I think my concern is just patients using herbs, you know, without knowing why they're using it or for any particular reason. I mean, ashwagandha is probably not the best herb to use as an example because it's a resina and it's, you know, safe to use, but there are other medicinal herbs that you wouldn't want to just use, you know, for no particular reason. Um, um, does that answer your question or? Uh, yes, uh, uh, that's right. Because you know, when we're talking about the absorption issue, uh, curcumin without knowing how much or how oh, it is right. absorbed. Yes, and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> curcumin is, is an example. I think a lot of preparations now are putting uh, piperine in with it because you, know, you don't get very much uh, curcuminoids absorbed if you're just taking, you know, uh, turmeric capsules on an empty stomach unless you have something in with it. And that's the brilliance of Ayurveda. It's like if you look at a formulation, most all the formulations have ginger and black pepper or long pepper or something in it. And it's like, why do they put the black pepper and the long pepper in it? Well, they put it in there for piperine. They put it in there because it, uh, it has an effect on GI absorption. And without it, you don't get very much absorbed. So it's very interesting that you know, for thousands of years, Ayurveda has known how to make these preparations so that they get absorbed. And now we're beginning to understand on a molecular basis why some of these things are in the preparations. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And there is one question from Amita. Uh, is it possible to send an email to you with questions? So, if Oh, absolutely. So if uh, and my, if my email can... is, uh, uh, Martha at aloha.net. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Nirupama is also asking if we can get a copy of the presentation slides. Yes, I'll be happy to do that for you. Um, let's see, how's the best way to do that? I actually don't have a, a personal website. Um, so um, I can, you can send it to me and I will send over an email to everyone with the presentation as yes. well as a link to the recording of this session. So okay. that should That's work. very good. Okay. Sruti, I certainly appreciate your uh, technological wizardry. <laughs> it's nice. I, and, and thank you for starting this group. I think it's really great for us to meet like this on a fairly regular basis and, you know, share each person's what they want to share and, uh, and just question and answer. It's very, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martha, for being here. Um, before we wrap up, um, I just want to put a quick request out there. Um, thank you for joining today, but um, I would also love it if you could share, um, you know, your uh, nomination for another guest speaker. Um, if you know somebody who you think is doing interesting work in Ayurveda um, and you think they would be a good fit for the Women in Ayurveda guest spe speaker series, please drop me a note uh, nominating sure. them and um, I will be in touch with you um, and try and coordinate them on the calendar. Um, and one other thing too, um, there's a question about um, a website. I put a link in my PowerPoint presentation. It's from the University of Indiana, Dr. Dave Flockhart's lab. Uh, and um, it, so it, when you go through, uh, you know, towards the end, there's the, there's the Google, and then I just fast forwarded through a website. And that website is, um, it's meant for pharmacologists. So it's, it's exhaustive, but what it, the way he's organized it um, is he has each one of the major cytochrome P450 enzymes that metabolize pharmaceuticals. And then he has a list of the pharmaceuticals that either induce or inhibit it. And he has started adding medicinal herbs. It's not, you know, he doesn't have that many yet. So it may not be that useful, but it is being updated all the time. So, um, you know, so that's one thing. And then um, the other thing I can say is if you just want to just send me an email privately, I'm happy to share with you just, you know, some other information that might, if you have other questions. And, uh, and then I can also reproduce that link for you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. I know we're a little bit over time. I'm sorry about that. But um, thank you once again, uh, Martha, uh, for kickstarting our guest speaker series. Um, and thank you, everybody else, for joining today on a Friday. Um, happy holidays. And you know, if I don't see you all before the new year, then uh, Merry Christmas and a very happy new year to you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Same thank to you. Same to you. Namaste. Thank you. Yeah. Namaste.